Okay, um, we're going to start with some exercises out of the back of chapter 16. We'll, inter we'll do basic earnings per share along with the weighted average calculation, which is the bulk of the complexity for basic today. And then on, what's today, Thursday? Yeah, Tuesday next week, we'll finish up with the... Uh, diluted earnings per share part. So, because there's two levels of complexity with the earnings per share aspect. So we'll, we'll do basic today, do fully diluted on Tuesday, and then that'll finish up chapter 16. We have the review for the first midterm one week from today, and then the first midterm is that following Tuesday for you guys. Okay? All right, so let's start with exercise number 12 on page 45. On this one, at the beginning of 2011, Hardin Company had 220,000 shares of $10 par common stock outstanding. During the year, it engaged in the following transactions related to its common stock. On March 1st, it issued 45,000 shares of stock, and then it tells you what it issued it at, $22 per share. That's not really applicable. On June 1st, they issued a 15% stock dividend then on July 1, they sold an additional 10,000 shares of stock at $27 a share. August 31st, a two-for-one stock split, reducing the par value to $5 a share. October 31st, it reacquired 95,000 shares of Treasury stock. And then on November 30, it reissued 45,000 of those same shares. All right, so those are the transactions. When you're doing this, you want to do a table for the period. So that's the months that are applicable. Actual, outstanding, You need to account for any dividend, stocks, dividends, or splits. And I'll get a total, and then we'll do weighted average. Okay, so for this particular company, the first actual transaction concerning common stock that occurred was on March the 1st. So we have the period from January through February. At that point in time, there were 220,000 shares of common stock actually outstanding for those two months. But the rule is that we treat stock dividends and stock splits as if they occurred at the earliest possible moment in time. All right? So we assume that the stock dividend of 15% that really actually was not issued until July 1 and the stock split that occurred on August 31st, we assume they happened on January 1 of the year. So we need to multiply this by 1.15 and then again by 2. 
So 1.15, if you have 100 shares and they give you a 15% stock dividend, you now have 115 shares. Then if it splits, you have 230 shares. Does that make sense? All right, so the 220 times 1.15 times 2 is, three, is 500 and 6,000. And that's for 2 twelfths. It was two out of the 12 months you had, in essence, 506,000 shares outstanding. That gives you 84,333. Then, on March 1st, you actually issued an additional 45,000 shares. That brings the to 65 of common stock outstanding. You're still going to multiply this by 1.15 and by 2. Because of the stock dividend of 15% that is going to occur on June 1. All right? Yeah. No, it does the opposite. It, stock dividends and stock splits are designed to drive the price down. Because remember, in, in it, you know, this one is trading in the $27 to $30 range, so it's kind of contrary to what you wouldn't really expect a stock split under those conditions. But when stock starts getting up in price, when it starts getting up in the two, three hundred, especially when it starts to exceed, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars, companies traditionally split in order to bring it back down into that sweet spot of somewhere between $30 to $200. You know, that just seems to be the perception in the marketplace where a stock's supposed to trade at. And you'll see, you go look at the Wall Street Journal and you see, you just list, because you can, at one page, you can see literally hundreds and hundreds of stock quotes, and, and they're all pretty close to that range. So... Okay? All right? So, this is going to occur because until we get to the June 1 stock split. So, March through April. That's three months. I'm sorry. That's May, not April. May is the month before June. So you multiply this out, you get 609,500, and that's going to be the case for three twelfths, or 152,375. Then on June 1st, you're actually going to issue 15% stock dividend. So for the month of June only, you're going to actually have $304,750 worth of stock. That's just the 115%. That's after the stock dividend was issued on June 1st. Yes, that's just that number times 1.15. But you still have to multiply it by 2 because the stock split's going to occur. So if this 265,000 times 1.15 or just 1.15? 265 times 1.15 is 304,750. Yes. And then when you double that for the stock split, you get the same number, the 609,500. So on a midterm, if you wanted to combine the two of them, 
collapse them and do this for four twelfths, just to save you some punching in a calculator, perfectly acceptable. I'm just doing it to illustrate all the individual steps. Okay. Did that make that last comment make sense? Nothing really has changed in the total here between those two periods. So if you wanted to do this period, March to June, and do four twelfths of 609,500, fine. Okay? Then on July 1, we issued 10,000 shares. So now in July... we have 314,750. And that's going to be the same until the stock split occurs at the end of August. Still need to multiply that by 2, because in June and August the stock split has not occurred yet. And now we get 629,500. That's going to be for two twelfths, or one oh four seven nine nine seventeen. One oh four nine seventeen. Yes. Because it includes the whole month of August. Okay. Yep. The end of August, the stock split occurs. So you actually now have the 620, 29, 500. Just for the month of August, because I'm um, just for the month of September, because at the end of September is when the uh, Stock split occurs. Is, this the, is that the beginning of September? Yes, beginning of September through the just the beginning of September. It's just the one month. I doubled that number. Stock split has now occurred. Okay. Right. So September and October. So th we now have six twenty nine five hundred because the stock split has actually occurred two twelfths, and we get the same one oh four nine seventeen. Then for the month of November, we buy back 95,000 shares on October 31st. So subtract 95,000 from the 229,500, we get 534,500. And that's going to be for one twelfth, or forty-four thousand five forty-two. And then we have, lastly, the month of December. And at the beginning of December, of that ninety-five thousand treasury stock shares that we have, we resell forty-five thousand of it. So if we add forty-five, we get five seventy-nine five hundred. 
500 times 1 twelfth is 48,292. Add all that up and you get 590,168. And that is the weighted average shares outstanding. I subtracted 95,000. Yeah, and, and then I added back 45,000. Issue we issued it. That means we sold it back oh. to the general public. Yeah, when you issue stock, you're issuing it to the marketplace or to an individual shareholder who knows who bought it. I added 45,000 to the November balance. Yes? I have a question. Um, I know you said the lump of five comes from the stock dividend yes. on uh, June 1. But dividends and splits occur at the earliest moment of time. Yes? Okay, I, there's going to be an example, not this next exercise, but the one after it that's going to perfectly illustrate it. So hold on to that question because it'll really illustrate it. If you don't do this, you won't have comparative years, and it'll be it'll be really really obvious in about ten minutes because <laughs> I'm gonna do another one of these first, and then I'll do one where we actually calculate basic earnings per share. Okay. Let's do the very next problem on the same page. Problem number 13. Oh, shoot. I left my good eraser down in the other room. Oh, man. Steal another one. All right, at the beginning of the current year, Hardin Company had 20,000 shares of $10 par common stock outstanding. During the year, it engaged in the following transactions related to its common stock so that at year end, it had 63,800 shares outstanding. On April the 2nd, it issued 5,000 shares of stock. On June 4th, it issued an additional 4,000 shares of stock. On July 1, it issued a 10% stock dividend. September 28th, a two-for-one stock split. October 3rd, it bought back 1,000 shares as treasury stock. And then on November 27th, it reissued that same 1,000 shares. So. We have from January to the beginning of April, so January to March, we have 20,000 shares outstanding. What are we going to multiply that by? 1.1 for the stock, 10% stock dividend, and 2 for the stock split. And that's going to give us 44,000 for three twelfths or eleven thousand. Why is it one? Like one point one. Okay, you've got ten stock. You own ten shares of stock. They're gonna give you a ten percent stock dividend. How many do you have afterwards? I have ten. You had ten to before this 11. dividend. 
Now they're going to give you a 10% of that as, I heard it back here. You're going to have 11. So what's 11 divided by 10? 1.1. Right? If it makes, if it, if it, if it makes more sense to put 110% and 200% in your mind, that's fine. It's the same calculation. Right? Okay. Then on the next transaction is on April the 2nd, they issued those 5,000 shares. So in April... In May, we now have 25,000 shares. Still have to multiply it by the 1.1 and the 2. So now we have a total of 55,000 for 2 twelfths, or 9,167. On June 4th, we issued 4,000 shares of stock, bringing the actual to 29,000. And that's going to be the same until, really, until the beginning of October. So we'll do this for until September. Multiply it by the 1.1 and the 2 and you get 63,800 for 4 twelfths. Because I'm going to remember all the individual calculations I did last time for the stock dividend. I'm going to collapse those into one calculation. Because you're multiplying it by the stock dividend and the stock split anyway, so there's no real sense in doing it three times. We could, if, that, if you want to do that. You could do it for just the month of June and then do it again for July and August and September and then do it again, well, because it occurs at the end of September. So you could split it into two, but you know, one twelfth and a three twelfth calculation, but the algebra is the same. So for October and November, we now have sixty two thousand eight hundred outstanding. Yeah. Now, multiplied by four months, divided by 12. Huh? No, that's about a fourth. Oh, you're right. I wrote the wrong number down. Thank you. It's 21,000. I skipped to the next line. Sorry. See, that's good that you guys have computers. You can do this for me. All right, so does everybody see where I get from the 63 down to the 62? We buy back 1,000 shares at the beginning of October. Yes? October 3rd, we reacquire 1,000 shares of Treasury stock. So... During the month, during this period of four months, the stock dividend got issued and the stock split occurred. All right? So now we really have, at the beginning of October, on October 1, we have, in actuality, 63,800 shares of stock outstanding. That's what's circulating in the marketplace. 
We're going to go out and buy 1,000 shares of it, bringing our total down to 62,800. All right? And that's going to be for 2 twelfths. And that was that number I wrote up before, 10,467. fun to listen to on the video <laughs> the microphone right there in my throat and then for the month of December we're going to reissue that thousand shares bringing us back to the 63,800 and that'll be 1 12th or 5,317 add all that up we have 57,218 Two months later. Well, because maybe why do you one reason that you buy treasury stock is to stave off a decline in prices. So maybe the prices were going down. And so they bought a thousand shares just to kind of help bump that, you know, perception is ninety percent. And so they bumped that back up and it worked. And then two months later. The stock price had climbed up to where it, the management felt it should be, so they turned around and sold it. Why not? So, why did you decide to put uh, the reissue the 1,000 um, shares in December and not November? Because it occurred at the end of November. So then it's you want to round it to the closest month, okay. always, just for simplicity's sake. Okay. So, if yeah. it was November 14th, then we would say November? Mm -hmm. That would be written then the whole month of November would be included. Yep. And if it was the 15th, flip a coin, because at that point, <laughs> what do I care? <laughs> you know, because it could go either way in November, because there's 30 days. <clears throat> Actually, the 15th, I would put it back one. We're in a month, we're 31 days. This, the difference between December 15th and December 16th, uh, you can't tell you. Right, because that and I included that in here. Yeah. Yeah, because it occurred at the end of September. So in that case, you did not. Uh, yeah, I included the whole month of September in here. But it's because you have a transaction in October. Right. Okay. That's the next actual transaction. Yeah. Was the beginning of October. All right. You guys are looking at me funny. I don't want to move on if you don't understand. Maybe you'll understand after this next one. Okay? Problem or exercise number 16 on 46, the next page. Uh, seven, 16, on page 46. Okay, on this one, Lucas Company reports net income of 5125 for the year ended December 31st, 2013, its first year of operations. On January 4th of that year, they issued 9,000 shares of common stock. That was their initial public offering. That's when they started the whole operation. On August the second, they issued an additional 3,000 shares, resulting in 12,000 shares outstanding for the year. So we'll start 
by calculating 2013. All right, so we have 9,000 shares for 7 twelfths, because that's from January to July. So that's 5,250. And then from July to December, we actually have 12,000 shares for the remaining 5 twelfths of the year. 5,000 shares. So earnings per share is 5,125 divided by, oops, this total here is 10,250. Divided by the 10,250. And that's going to give us an earnings per share of 50 cents per share. Yes, sir. gives it to us. Oh. Very first sentence it says they reported basic earnings, well, I'm sorry, they reported net income of 5125 All right. $2,014. During 2014, Lucas earned net income of $16,400. It issued an additional 2,000 shares of stock on March 3rd and declared and issued a two-for-one stock split on November 3rd, resulting in 28,000 shares outstanding at year end. So from January to February, we have... 12,000 shares times 2 for the stock split, or 24,000. And that's going to be 2 twelfths. And then March to the end of the year, December, we'll have 14,000 actual shares outstanding, still times the stock split, for 28,000 times, oh, and this is going to total 4,000. 10 twelfths is going to give us 23,333, or a total of 27,333. Their earnings for 2014 were 16,400 divided by the 27,333 or an earnings per share of 60 cents. Now, here's the answer to your question. If you're going to present a comparative income statement showing net income increasing from the first year of 2013 of 5,125 to the year end 2014 of 16,400, does this calculation that's on the board right now make sense? Did earnings per share go from 50 cents to 60 cents? Well, yeah, because that's what I wrote up there. But did that make sense? What happened to earnings? What happened to net income? It more than tripled. What happened to earnings per share? It went up a dime. Does that make sense? That's why you have to make this calculation.
at the earliest. moment in time. You have to take that stock split all the way back as if it occurred on January 1, 2013. Because that's the only way you can show comparative numbers. Because in reality, the stock earnings per share went from a quarter to 60 cents. That makes sense. Does everyone understand that? <laughs> so the answer is no. <laughs> okay. This is what happened. We always take stock splits back to the earliest moment in time, even if it's a prior year, if we're going to present the prior year side by side in a comparative income statement. Right? Okay. So... The earliest moment in time is all the way back here. If we'd have taken this 9,000, multiplied it by 2, made it 18,000, multiplied it by the 7 twelfths, we'd have gotten $10,500 here. Then take the 12,000, multiply it by 2 to bring 24,000 times the 5 twelfths, we'd have gotten 10 here. That makes that 20,500 because of the stock split. We're doubling everything. But, for, the but we're going to show 2013's number on the same page on our financial statement. And when we talk about earnings per share, because earnings per share is arguably the biggest number that they all talk about. So you're comparing the stock split in It's the only way that makes sense. You, ha you have to do it that way because an increase in earnings per share from 25 cents to 60 cents is reality. That's what it really did because income went from 5,125 to 16,400. It tripled in a year. Oh, okay. I understand what you're saying. Now you see? Yeah. Yes, in order to do comparative income statements. And that's what you would do on an analyst call. You know, the CFO and the CEO always gets on these conference calls and they invite major shareholders and all the financial analysts that issue the reports on that particular company. You know, the buy, hold, sell recommendations from all the various brokerage firms. That's what they do. They almost always lead with earnings per share, whether it's good or bad. Coca-Cola last week had an earnings per share decline year to year from 2013 to 2014 of two cents. It was the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Two cents, it went down. It went from 44 cents down to 42 cents. And that was all they were talking about at that call. I didn't actually listen to the call, but I'm sure, because I've done those calls in my past. All right? And that's why. Yes? What happens if you have, like, a, a five-year review? If you, want to five you go back. If you have any stock, this only applies to stock splits and dividends. So let's say that you have um, three dividend payouts and two stock splits. You make it years. back five years. It's not that complicated because all you're doing is doubling the weighted, or weighted outstanding <laughs> shares. So Yeah. Would you do it, you would yes. Do of course you would. Uh, yeah. So you multiply it by four if you have two stocks? Of course. You have to. Okay. Because at the, from, the, from the beginning of the five-year period to the end of the five-year period, the stock actually went up four times. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to do it that way. Because so it wouldn't be comparative otherwise. Yeah. You multiply the four to all the other uh, years that... The earliest moment in time, whatever you're going to present, you have to show it at the early, as if it had occurred at the earliest moment in time. Is everybody with me? Because we've got one more year to do. We've got 2015. 
2015, Lucas earned net income of $23,520. The only common stock transaction that occurred during 2015 was a 20% stock dividend issued on July 15. So 2015, we actually now have 28,000 shares of stock because this stock split has occurred. So there's really 28,000, but we have to multiply that by 1.2. That's going to give us 33,600. If we take the earnings per share calculation of 16,400 in net income, divide it by the 33,600 weighted shares outstanding, we get a 70 cent. Huh? Thank you. Yes. No, because the only thing that occurred was the stock dividend. 23,520. All right. But what about the previous years? We've got to multiply this by 1.2. And that's going to give us 16,400 divided now by 32,800 or 50 cents, multiply this by 1.2, and that'll give us the 5,125 divided by 24,600, or 21 cents. So the three-year earnings per share goes from 21 cents to 50 cents to 70 cents. And that's as close to reality as you get because earnings went from 5,125 to 16,400, still climbed another 50% jump up to 23,500. So it makes sense that it jumps also. Questions on that part of it? I have one more before I kick you loose for the week. rush home and get your valentine flowers still still meet the rush if you want to see something sad go to HEB on Valentine's Day late in the afternoon and go to the card aisle and there will stand with all a hangdog look all of the husbands who forgot they are digging through the dregs of what's left over in that aisle. It is just a sad and pathetic sight. <laughs> and it is annual. <laughs> All right, number 17 on the same page. Yeah, don't even think about going to the florist on that day. Mona Company reported net income of $29,975 for 2013. During all of 2013, Mona had 1,000 shares of 
$100 par non-convertible preferred stock outstanding on which the year's dividend had been paid. At the beginning of 2013, they had 7,000 shares of common stock outstanding. On April the 2nd, they issued another 2,000 shares of common stock so that 9,000 were outstanding at the end of the year. Common dividends paid 17,000 during the year and at the end of 2000, well, and then it gives you the market price. All right? So, basic earnings per share. Basic earnings per share is net income attributable to common shareholders because the denominator is common shares. So we have to extract out of the net income any shares, any net part portion of the net income that doesn't apply to common stock. So we take the 29,000, God bless you, 975, and we subtract from it the preferred dividend. So there were um, 1,000 shares at a $100 par value, and it pays a 10% dividend. Multiply all that out, you get $10,000. Right, because a thousand shares at a hundred dollar par value is a hundred thousand dollars times ten percent. So we subtract the ten thousand, divide that by we had seven thousand shares from January through March times three twelfths or one thousand seven fifty. And then we had 9,000 after we issued the 2,000 2, shares times 9 twelfths for 6,750. That's a total of 8,500. And that gives us $2.35. Now the only thing I'm going to mention, rather than do the next pro next exercise number 18, is, is that whenever you have either discontinued operations or in the, up until the end of this year, extraordinary gains or losses, you have to report this in its flavor. All right, so you have to have net income from operations net income, earnings per share from operations, earnings per share from discontinued operations, earnings per share from extraordinary gain, and then net income, earnings per share. All right? So you have to report it if there is any of that on your multi-step income statement. If you don't have it, which this one doesn't. The next one has an extraordinary uh, gain. Oh, an extraordinary loss but I'm not going to worry about it because extraordinary losses are going away because the FASB killed them off here about a month ago. All right? Does that make sense? No, because that's just how much of this uh, 19975 they distributed to the common shareholders. They gave them seventeen grand of it, almost all of it. <laughs> which is highly unusual also. But if it's a closely held corporation, that's not a bad way of doing it. Okay? Questions on this? Because if you can't understand basic earnings per share now, watch the video over the weekend if I've lost you anywhere along the way. So, because next Tuesday we're going to do fully diluted earnings per share. So I want to make sure that you're comfortable right now before we move on. Because it really gets a little surreal. Is it always going to be preferred dividends? 
Yes, it's always going to be preferred dividends, yes. Yep. And it could be, you could have two classes of preferred stock outstanding, you know. Even that is still considered a simple, simple uh, capital structure. All right.